It's a leopard. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. Rabbi, 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 you Rabbi, cannot his disease, you Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you can do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. Seek your own honor. Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? Go. Show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to watch any of the uh, Chosen um, series, uh, but uh, it's a dynamic expression of the, the, the life of Jesus Christ. And if you haven't had a chance, uh, please uh, see it. It's, it's been amazing. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I think a lot of people are talking about and watching to see the stories of Jesus come to life. And uh, just this one is just a reminder to me about how the power of the power of God, the power of Jesus, the power and love of Christ, um, that he can bring healing to a leper and uh, bring hope to our lives. So would you uh, bow your heads with me, please, and let us pray. Lord, we are gathered uh, today because our faith in you is strong. And we know ourselves to be your beloved children. We know in you we have infinite value. You always have a good plan for us. We also know that you want us to be a part of your kingdom story and to experience you in new ways, just as we have witnessed in a, in a simple video. And so we come to this moment to hear your word because it shows us the way to recognize your presence in our lives. Your word also gives us as a church direction to fulfill your mission. So what are you calling us to hear today? For above everything in the world, Lord, we know you to be our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Well, I've been uh, waiting uh, quite a while to uh, preach this sermon to all of you. I actually wrote this sermon, it was July 1st. Uh, I, was, I was getting ready 
to uh, go off to Colorado for my son's wedding. And uh, I had to get things done in advance. That's just the way we do things around here. And so I realized I needed to get this sermon done. So it was, you have to understand what I was writing this about three weeks ago. I've had a long time waiting to be able to share it with you. And that's actually interesting because today's parable is about waiting. It's about waiting. Not, the, not maybe this kind of waiting, but the kind of waiting we need to, to do in maybe thinking about or confirming kind of judgment on people. And that, that image of Jesus and the others first making a judgment and, and not sure, you know, ready to, you know, ready to act. And Jesus had a whole different perspective on how he judged the person that he came into contact, the leper that he came into contact with. And it's something that we're not really good at doing sometimes. This whole idea of judging is really something we're not good at doing. And I I don't want to just start by saying, I am probably the chief of sinners in this. So sometimes you write a sermon to preach to yourself. So I, I, I recognize that I also need to hear these words for myself. This parable is actually another one of the harvest parables uh, that has featured, it's going to feature seeds and weeds. And a few weeks back, you might remember I spoke uh, on the parable just ahead of this one, which was, it's also in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the four soils. And Jesus talked about the seeds being planted in the four various soils, which is probably a sermon you're all familiar with if you weren't here or a message, or a passage, or a parable that you're all familiar with. And two weeks ago, Cindy Ovakaitis preached on the parable of the mustard seed, and which is also in this very same chapter. And the parable today of the seeds and the weeds is probably not one of the parables you will be as familiar with. You're familiar with those other two, but this one is a little bit, you know, we don't read it too often in the church because uh, it kind of follows those other two great parables. So I'm glad to share it with you this morning. Before we read that parable, what's that definition again that we've been saying? I, I sound like a broken record, I know, on this topic of what a parable is, but I'll say it again. A parable is a brief story using physical symbols to illustrate a spiritual truth. Jesus uses a very brief story He picks some interesting physical uh, symbols and he uses those to illustrate a spiritual truth that we need to hear. And the symbols in this parable today uh, include seeds and weeds and the harvest of the, of the, the, the seeds. And by the way, since it's now uh, pretty much the end of July, I want to ask you this question since we're talking about weeds today. Is there anybody that's really just tired of pulling weeds? Come on. Who's tired of pulling weeds in their yard? Who doesn't have a yard and is thankful they don't have to pull weeds? There we go. I knew it was a couple of people. <laughs> right? I'm tired of pulling weeds. I am. That's like the, you know, you, you go away for a few days, you come back, and it's like, it, where, I just pulled those weeds, and they're back again, right? Uh, well, anyone uh, who's overwhelmed with, uh, with pulling weeds will appreciate, uh, will appreciate this message today. And this parable actually might give you the answer to all your problems when it comes to pulling weeds. If, it depends on how you take it and how you look at it. But I am telling you, the Bible does have answers to all your, all your needs, <laughs> and it includes answers to pulling weeds, and we're gonna learn about that today. So here's the passage, here's the the parable of the seeds and the weeds. And this is found in Matthew chapter 13, and it starts in verse 24. And it goes like this. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy, came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and he went away. And when the weeds sprouted and formed heads, 
then the weeds also appear. Oh, I'm sorry. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? The enemy did this, he replied. And the servant asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them out? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot, uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell you, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds and, and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. So a farmer goes out, plants seeds to grow in a field of wheat, but among the wheat comes those pesky weeds. We all get weeds in our garden, right? And, and all around all of our plantings. It's one of the worst jobs of the summer. Well, I'm not a farmer, and I actually wanted to see if this is a real thing today for wheat uh, farmers, and if they really still deal with this problem or not. So I was doing a little research, and I found myself attending wheat school online. And here's what I found out at wheat school. There's four main considerations a farmer has for controlling weeds and winter wheat, and they are to minimize yield losses from wheat competition. They're also for improving harvesting efficiency if we can cover more acres per hour in a clean field uh, versus certainly a, uh, a weedy field. The third consideration is the cleanliness of straw. Buyers want clean straw. They don't want to inherit your weed seeds and weed roots uh, for their operation. And then lastly, uh, weed seed return. We don't want to let annual weeds growing, setting seed and returning it to the soil for future years to come. So in a perfect world, we have a wheat field like this one here where the producer was able to go in with a pre-plant weed control treatment to get rid of all the winter annual and perennial weeds to get the crop off to a clean start. That's the best way to minimize yield losses from weeds. But what... So I love this professor who tells us a little bit about weeds in the wheat. Because uh, he said, in a perfect world, we just kill the weeds before the wheat is planted. That's what he said. In a perfect world, we just kill the wheat, uh, the weeds before the wheat is planted. But as he pointed out, we don't live in a perfect world, do we? We don't live in a perfect world and weeds grow and make wheat harvesting very difficult or whatever it is we're growing. And in Jesus's day, they had the very same problem. Nothing has changed in all these years. But they didn't have, they didn't, Jesus is, uh, the people in Jesus, they didn't have herbicides and combines and whatever else they used to, to clean out the weeds, I don't know. But um, they didn't have that. But farmers did struggle with how to handle those weeds that naturally grew in the fields. And the problem was that if you pull up the weeds, you usually pull up the wheat with it. And that, as the farmer in the parable tells us, was bad business because too much of the wheat would be lost. Instead, the farmer tells his servants, wait, let the weeds and the wheat grow together and then at the harvest, we will separate the weeds from the wheat. We will throw the weeds into the fire and gather the wheat into the barns. Now let me tell you, Jesus is telling this parable and his disciples are listening. The disciples are not farmers. They are fishermen, most of them. Most of them are fishermen. And they didn't understand a word about what, <laughs> what Jesus was trying to tell them in this particular parable. 
And so they ask Jesus to give him, give them a little more explanation. And so I want to read what happens next. It says that then he left the crowd and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Jesus, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds, the weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then he finishes, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear. I, I don't know if you caught that when Jesus starts talking about weeping and gnashing of teeth and sorrow and remorse, um, there's a lot of anxiety and pain in when he starts talking about what's gonna happen to those who are found to be weeds. In a perfect world, weeds don't grow in good soil, in a perfect world. But Jesus tells his disciples, we don't live in a perfect world. And the weeds, which he says are the, are the sons of the evil one, of the devil, and the good seed are the, are the people of God, these two, the weeds and the wheat, grow together. In other words, Jesus is well aware that in our not-so-perfect world, sinners and saints live and grow together. But Jesus says it is ineffective to try to weed the sinners from the saints. He tells the disciples, it's not your job to remove the sinners from the saints because at the time of the harvest, at the end of time, or the end of their time, God will separate the sinners from the saints. It's not your job, he says. It's not the, the, the servant's job to do that. He has harvesters for that. The sinners will go off to weep and gnash their teeth, while the saints will be a part of the great harvest of heaven, where Jesus says the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. No doubt, we all want to be found to be righteous and go off to someplace sunny and beautiful, right, with God. That's what we want. We don't want to be a cloudy day like this. When we go off to heaven, it's going to be a sunny day, um, and we're going to enjoy being in the presence of God. But I find this parable to be very, extremely interesting, very interesting. In the light of a lot of the things that are happening in our culture today, this parable, in my judgment, speaks volumes to how Christians should respond to sinfulness or perceived sinfulness or whatever it is, anything that, that looks to be sinful. Jesus tells us in this parable that the servants of God want to throw the sinners prematurely into the fire. They want, to, they want to pull out the weeds prematurely. But the master, God, says, wait. Let the wheat grow with the weeds. If you pull the weeds out prematurely, you will also destroy the wheat. If you judge the sinners prematurely, you will destroy the lives of many of the saints in the process, is what he's saying. Wait, the master says. Let the harvesters, the angels, the professionals of God separate the good from the evil so that only the sinners go to, go to hell and all the saints are preserved. 
I don't know about you, this is amazing wisdom. This is amazing wisdom in this parable. Every one of us who loves God and follows Christ, we can understand that it might be premature to judge the wicked, that we might ruin a lot of saints in judging sinners prematurely. So Jesus wants us to know that we can trust God's judgment. In his time, we can trust him. Let him make the judgment. And we can do that by learning that it is better to wait and to hold back judgment. That we need to recognize that in the end, God is the only one who should judge the sinners. And that God is the only one that we are accountable to. Let's not take God's job of judging into our own hands. Because the master says, wait. You're going to mess this up, he says. So just wait. So I have to warn you that you may or may not like where this is going, but I, I, may, I don't know. I hope, I hope you do. But I, wanted to, I was thinking about this. I can't keep silent about, about some of the judgmental decisions that people are making in our own culture today. I happen to, remember I told you I wrote this sermon about three weeks ago. And just before then, I was in Wichita uh, at our our church's national church convention. I was gathered with all these Christians, a lot of my Christian friends from all over the country, and we were gathered for this meeting. And it was at the end of June. And you will remember that at the end of June, Roe versus Wade was thrown out by the Supreme Court. 50 years of practice. And what I witnessed while I was at that Christian conference was all the Christian women that I knew, I've known for years, mourning this particular ruling. People who were upset and hurting about it. And I could see that these women recognized that a whole lot of innocent saints were being wounded at the same time. Good people who make good decisions and faithful decisions were weeping and raging because judgment was being imposed on on the behaviors of saints and sinners, possibly prematurely. And then I was hearing, then I came home and I started to write this sermon. I was hearing this text in this parable and I heard the master say, wait, let the weeds grow with the wheat and I will separate the sinners from the saints in the end. It's not our job to cast judgment. Jesus is trying to show his listeners in this parable that leaving the judgment to us will just mess things up. If we're the ones who are gonna make all the judgments, we're gonna mess things up. And not only that, but this is exactly what has happened and might happen with other decisions that are threatened by us trying to take the matters of God into our, own act, into our own hands. Let's just look more deeply at this parable because I know that this one big question might be overshadowing the message of the text. So I don't want that to happen. The parable wants us to learn something about judging others. And the first of which, and maybe the most important message, is to wait. Waiting is very difficult. Come on, we do not, none of us like to wait. I already pointed out at the beginning of this sermon that our culture is not fond of waiting. We complain when our food isn't, um, isn't uh, you know, at the table right after we order it and uh, when traffic is backed up and when we don't get paid exactly when we anticipated we would get paid, or I don't know, there's all kinds of things we complain about because we can't wait, right? Every one of you, you're thinking right now, you can think of something you just can't, you you complain about because you can't wait. And this is a big problem in our world and in our culture today. And when we are waiting, we we sometimes get angry. I, I, we, were in, we were in Colorado, and I don't know about if you know this or not, but Lynn and I love uh, In-N-Out Burger. 
It's only on the West Coast. And I found out there was an In-N-Out burger. There's four of them in Denver. So at nine o'clock at night, we arrived in Denver. And I said, well, I'm hungry. We got to go to In-N-Out. <laughs> so we drove to the nearest In-N-Out to our hotel. And 25 people were in line in the drive through ahead of us. I was not happy. <laughs> I've been waiting a long time for that burger. And now you're going to put 25 people in the line ahead of me at 9 o'clock at night. And I had to wait. I was grumbling the whole time, waiting to get at my food. Sometimes we actually get angry at God for making us wait. We pray and we plead with God to do something when our lives are crashing around us or when we need healing or when we need someone saved from their sickness or whatever it is. And we, sometimes we go, why? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't he do, why doesn't he act? But the better question, however, might just be to ask ourselves, would we really like it if God just did something every time there was a crisis or a disaster. Okay, so why didn't he swerve those planes away from the World Trade Center, right? Why didn't he do that? He has the power to do that. He could have just pushed, that, pushed those planes aside. We just saw today how he can heal a leper. Why couldn't he just turn those planes aside? Would we really like it if we lived in a world where God ruled directly and immediately? where every thought and action were instantly judged and, if necessary, punished on the scale of absolute holiness. You know what would happen in that world? Our free spirits would hate that world. While waiting is difficult, Jesus showed us that the way of love and grace was, better, was a better practice than condemnation and judgment. Jesus showed us in his many teachings that it was better to wait, to show love, and to give forgiveness because these acts more often than not lead to repentance and healing. We need to wait. Waiting produces the best harvest. That was the, that was the message of the parable. Just wait. We'll get the best harvest at the end. And I love what the, the master suggests in this verse. He, he basically says, waiting will produce that best harvest. And he says, we won't prematurely kill the good wheat. Waiting for the harvest and the judgment that comes in God's time ensures the best results. Why is it that God always knows the best? Why is he always right, right? When we trust in his timing, the best always prevails. You know, there are numerous stories of men and women in our world that have gone down the path of sin only to see the light and come home to faith in Christ over time. I'm thinking of people like John Newton who wrote that great hymn of faith, Amazing Grace, with those words, I once was lost, but now am found. I once was weeds, growing in the weeds, but now I am wheat. I'm thinking of people like Ignatius of Loyola, who in his young days lived a pretty worldly life, only to have his life changed after being struck by a cannonball and being healed through the work of the church. And Ignatius' transformed, transformational work and ministry in the world continues today in the Jesuit society. And, we're, and we, were talking, we were just talking the other day at our men's Bible study about Chuck Colson, who was an awful participant in the Nixon Watergate scandal, and who in prison gave his life to Christ and turned his life around to be a significant hero of faith for the rest of his life. You see, when we trust in God's timing, we find that we don't prematurely destroy wheat that might look like weeds. Waiting will make all things clear. Not long ago, I was talking to a young mom whose daughter had changed her life around. I remember just a few years ago, she was telling me, she, she kept, I saw her several times, she'd tell me about how her daughter's uh, marijuana use and was 
out of control and how the boys she was hanging around were such bad influences. And she even had to kick her out of the house because she couldn't be trusted and she, wouldn't, she would regularly steal from her. And the lies that she made up, they were awful, awful. But earlier this month, I'm talking to her and she told me about how she has turned her life around, how she was living in her own apartment now after graduating. And she had a job and she was studying to be something and how she could finally trust her enough to leave her alone with her little sister and little brother. The transformation is not complete in her. It may not even be complete in us. And it may not be complete in those we love and pray for around us. But by waiting, God makes all things clear. There is always hope. Prejudging only leads to anger, separation, hurtful words, and decisions. And as we know, Jesus would advocate that we wait and love and forgive as a first recourse in all of life's challenges. And lastly, waiting sets everyone free. When I turned to this parable earlier in the month, I had no idea what this message would be. I really didn't know. I, I, I picked the parable and I hadn't, hadn't really thought about what the message was gonna be. But it was very clear that the master had a message for us to really think hard about today. Waiting, the master says, that sets us free. Lynn will tell you that we love, when we go on vacation, it's always hassle-free, carefree, right? And we, but we spend a lot of time enjoying the sun. We love the sun at the beach or at the pool, whatever. And I, Jesus told his disciples that if we wait, let God do the judging, then we will shine like the sun in the kingdom of God. Now I got that image. I was thinking about it. To me, that sounds a lot like my vacations where I'm hassle-free and carefree and there is joy and I'm happy and I'm peaceful and life is good. And that's why I believe we should be careful with judging others too quickly. It's not our place to rush in and judge every situation like we think we are God. God doesn't rush in. He doesn't rush in. He doesn't jump in. So why should we? And the truth of the matter is that God doesn't act that way towards us ever. So why should we do it to others? And so let's just choose to wait. The master has the harvesters in place to separate the weeds and the wheat. Our job is to wait, to pray, to love, to forgive with the compassion of Jesus. And that love will set us free it will, say, it will set a lot of other people free and it will save us, save a lot of souls with us. So thanks be to God today. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your parables that challenge us each week. Boy, some of these words are hard for us and challenging for us not what we expected when we open up the word but you left us this word so we might be convicted and might be challenged and so let your words speak to us today and may we wait upon them and wait upon you in all that we do so that we might know your love and your freedom and your forgiveness and your joy Hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is